The woman known to history as Anna von der Mark, Duchess of Cleves, was most likely born at Swan Castle near Dusseldorf, Germany. Traditionally, historians have dated her birth to the 21st or 22nd of September, 1515, but one recent biographer has argued that a birth date sometime between the 28th of June and the 1st of July is more likely. Anna's father was Johann III, Duke of Cleves, and her mother was Maria, Duchess of Ulichburg. When Anna's parents were first married, they each ruled over their own separate territories. Although Johann succeeded to the ducal titles associated with his wife's lands, it was Maria who actually held the reins of government. Renaissance Germany provided very interesting opportunities for the political leadership and participation of noble women, and German dukedoms, principalities, and city-states were frequently governed by women. In the absence of a son, German noblemen, dukes, and princes were usually content to invest power in their daughters rather than any distantly related male heir. Anna's mother, Maria, was just such an heiress. As her father's only child, she acceded as Duchess and Regent of Ulichburg after his death. Maria governed her own territories as Regent, while her husband, Johann, inherited the ceremonial title associated with his wife's duchy. Within 15 years of their marriage, Anna's parents had finally merged the administrations of their separate ducal territories. Until then, Johann and Maria lived rather separate lives for a married couple. The Duke and Duchess of Cleves Ulichburg had four children together. Their eldest daughter, Sibylla, born in 1512, was three years older than Anna, and the two sisters shared a strong bond throughout their lives, continuing to exchange letters even after Anna departed Germany for England. Two younger siblings followed Anna, only a year apart. The only son, Wilhelm, was born in 1516, and the youngest daughter, Amalia, was born in 1517. Because Johann and Maria each administered different regional and political entities, they were often required to maintain separate residences during the first several years of their marriage. Anna spent most of her childhood at Berg Castle in Solingen, with her mother and her sisters. Her education was extremely interesting in the context of Renaissance Europe. Anna, Sibylla, and Amalia were likely instructed in regional property laws and customs of taxation, how to manage finances on a regional scale, as well as how to arbitrate disputes between and among officials and civilians. In addition, they learned how to run large estates, including the management of large-scale farming and livestock interests. Anna came from a family with many generations of strong women who played important governing roles in their communities. Because German noblewomen could often be expected to exercise full power and responsibility in the absence of male authority figures, Anna and her sisters received an education which their English contemporaries would have considered to be rather masculine in character. This should not suggest that the three young duchesses did not also learn domestic responsibilities, which were the lot of all early modern European women, from duchess to peasant. The daughters of the Duchess of Cleves Ulichburg were all taught household management, which for German noblewomen seems to have been much more hands-on than it was for English, French or Spanish aristocrats while elite women from England, Spain, or France almost never performed domestic tasks personally, German noble women were frequently taught to cook, to sew, and to make clothing. All of this strikes the observer as eminently sensible, since the chatelaine of a large estate could hardly be depended upon to manage an estate properly if she didn't really understand what was involved. The productivity and profitability of their daily activities earned praise for German noblewomen who were seen as equal contributors to their marriages and families. Indeed, sometimes a noblewoman's household economy might yield more profit than her lands, if shrewdly managed. 
Some aristocratic European women had the opportunity to pursue a scholarly and intellectual education, but this was probably not the case with Anna. She may have been taught to dance, and her parents' ducal establishments regularly patronized musicians of talent, but Anna was not taught to sing or to play any musical instruments. She was taught to read and write, but only in German, and there is no indication that she studied the standard academia of the Renaissance like rhetoric, history, or philosophy. Most of her early education was probably centered around the purely practical, literacy, estate, and household management, sewing, and embroidery. This was not necessarily because of Anna's gender. Her father, Johann, a friend and correspondent of the famed Dutch philosopher Erasmus, was quite scholarly himself and does not seem to have discouraged intellectualism in his daughters. Anna's older sister, Sibylla, proved to be quite a fierce intellectual, a friend and correspondent of Martin Luther and a passionate and admired Lutheran reformer. However, Sibylla's religious and political leanings were likely influenced more by her husband than by her parents. Sibylla was married at the age of 15 to Prince Johann Friedrich, Elector of Saxony, the fiercely Protestant friend and supporter of Martin Luther, and a thorn in the side of Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. Anna's religious sensibilities are largely unknown, and the religious diversity that prevailed both in Germany and within her own family when she was growing up makes it even more difficult to guess what her actual beliefs might have been. Anna's mother was described as a strict Catholic who personally never wavered from her faith. Anna's father, Duke Johann, also remained a Catholic through the early Reformation but openly demonstrated Lutheran sympathies and religious tolerance. Anna's younger siblings, Wilhelm and Amalia, would spend a significant proportion of their adult lives at odds with one another over religion. Wilhelm consistently maintained friendly relations with the Protestant Schmalkaldic League, led by his brother-in-law, the Elector of Saxony. Wilhelm himself, however, remained a Catholic all his life and insisted that his sons be raised Catholic as well. The Lutheran sympathies of both Wilhelm and his father before him might be explained in part by their distrust for the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, with whom both father and son remained long engaged in a protracted land dispute over Gelderland. Anna's youngest sister, Amalia, was as passionately committed to Protestant reform as her eldest sister, Sibylla. Amalia never married or had children, and she is believed to have spent her elder years caring for and educating her young nieces. One anecdote describes Wilhelm's anger at his sister for instructing the girls in Protestant principles. This conflict reportedly enraged him enough to spur him to chase and threaten Amalia with a hatchet, a debacle which was ended by one of her servants who slammed and locked the door in the Duke's face. Considering all of this, it is impossible to say what Anna's own beliefs were, but exposure to such religious fluidity in her early life may have given her a broad perspective and a sense of spiritual and intellectual flexibility. It may also have taught her the value of both conformity and tolerance, depending on what was expected of her in any given circumstance. When Anna was 11 years old, she was betrothed to the son of the Duke of Lorraine, an unofficial arrangement which was nullified seven years later. One of Anna's biographers noted that she did not seem unduly distressed at the cancellation of her betrothal, despite the fact that she was now 18, three years older than Sibylla had been when she was married. Anna's attachment to her mother and to her family's household seems to have been one of sincere contentment. At the court of Cleves Ulichberg, mourning activities were strictly gendered. The noble men attended to political and estate matters in the mornings, while the noble women and their daughters attended to domestic tasks. The men and women of the court then came together in the afternoons for formal socializing and entertainments. Anna's typical day 
might find her embroidering and making clothing with her mother, her younger sister, and other women in the family's service in the Frauenzimmer, or women's room, during the mornings. The young women of the court were only allowed to meet and socialize with men during the afternoon gatherings or at the sumptuous dinners of up to nine courses, which were served nightly to as many as 300 guests. Anna's family enjoyed entertaining themselves and the court with music and theatrical entertainments. Hunting was another of the family's favorite pastimes, and Anna was said to have been a fine equestrienne who loved to join the hunt. In 1538, when Anna was 23, her father died, an event which made her cling all the closer to her mother. Yet her time in Germany was growing short, and both her own future, as well as the future of her family, now rested in the hands of her younger brother Wilhelm. It was in 1538 when Thomas Cromwell first made overtures to the young, new Duke of Cleves on behalf of Henry VIII, who was now determined to marry again. Persuaded by Cromwell that the support of Cleves would help Henry defend himself against the Emperor Charles V, without having to rely on the equally changeable King of France, Henry sought to conclude the marriage negotiations quickly. Duke Wilhelm had balked for months at Henry's request to allow portraits to be painted of Anna and Amalia and for Henry's emissaries to see the Duke's sisters in person. Frustrated, the English ambassadors had only been allowed to see them in the voluminous German court dress with their faces veiled. To help conclude the marriage treaty as quickly as possible, Henry finally offered to waive Anna's dowry and offered the Duke the generous payment of a hundred thousand florins instead. Wilhelm promptly accepted Henry's generous offer, writing that his sister looked forward eagerly to her wedding. In November of 1539, Anna departed Germany for her overland journey to Calais. The multitude of nobles, attendants, and servants who traveled with her made it a long journey, which was further delayed by bad weather on the Channel following their arrival in Calais, which prevented Anna from sailing for England for a few days. She was greeted and entertained there in the meantime by the Earl of Southampton and the Duke of Suffolk. From the time she landed in England, Anna was a little less homesick than she had been after saying goodbye to her home and family. She was greeted with kindness, enthusiasm, and admiration everywhere she and her escort stopped, with crowds of ordinary people turning out to see her and wish her well. All of Henry's nobles and ambassadors wrote to him of her cheerful amiability and assured him that she was as lovely as the portrait painted by Hans Holbein suggested. This portrait depicts Anne in Dutch-style dress, demure and serene, with widely spaced and heavily lidded eyes and shapely lips. Sources describe her as tall, slim, and blue-eyed with light blonde hair. For reasons which are still not altogether clear, Henry was less than pleased with his new bride-to-be. Hearing that his future wife was delayed on the road and that his wedding could not take place by Christmas, Henry resolved to be patient until the 6th of January, the date chosen for the postponement. Restlessness and anxiousness to meet her proved too much for Henry, however, and instead, on New Year's Day 1540, he set off to meet her earlier than originally planned, bearing a New Year's gift for his intended. Henry staged his entrance in a highly theatrical manner, in disguise. He approached Anna without hesitation, kneeling before her to kiss her hand. Unfortunately, Anne was taken aback by this behavior, not only for the sake of her modesty, but also because she had no idea who Henry was. There was no way she could have understood the mistake she had made. Unfamiliar with English culture, and therefore unable to understand that Henry expected her to recognize her so-called true love through his disguise, Henry was humiliated that Anna appeared repulsed and attempted to ignore him. He abruptly left the room and, throwing off his disguise, 
he returned in a decidedly more kingly-looking coat of royal purple. Deeply embarrassed, Anna bowed deeply before him, and Henry kissed her briefly before politely extricating himself from the situation. But the king was loud in his dissatisfaction as soon as he was out of earshot of his new fiancée. He was so upset that he had forgotten to give Anna the New Year's gift he had brought, a jeweled sable fur. This video is sponsored by Narwhal, the company who brings to you the amazing 2-in-1 robot mop and vacuum, the Narwhal T10, which comes with its own mop cleaning station. The Narwhal has very strong suction power as well as side brushes to reduce hair entanglement. You can see when you empty the Narwhal just how much dirt and debris it picks up. With two rounded triangle mops, each rotating at 180 RPM, that's three times per second, the Narwhal deep cleans your floor with no stains left behind. As well as this, when the mop detects it is dirty, it returns to the station to self-clean the cleaning heads and the mops dry automatically to stop germs from growing. Narwhal uses smart mapping algorithms to navigate your home intelligently, mounting thresholds and rugs with ease. Its cliff sensor means it will never fall off a step or ledge and with the two big 5-litre water tanks you will never be short of water. Plus, the Narwhal has its own app for fingertip control and a handy base station for storage and self-cleaning. Just go to the description box now to find out more. Narwhal and the people profiles working together. Henry returned to Greenwich incensed. He remonstrated with courtiers who had previously reported that Anne was pleasing, just as Henry seemed to have believed Anna to be when he saw Holbein's portrait. He complained bitterly to Thomas Cromwell that his intended was nothing fair as she has been reported. I like her not, he stated emphatically, and demanded what could be done to circumvent the marriage. Unfortunately, since there seemed to be no way to nullify his engagement without risking the anger and enmity of Cleves, Henry went ahead with the wedding as planned on the 6th of January 1540. He would spend the scant six months of his marriage to Anna attempting to find some avenue to divorce her. The morning after their wedding night, Thomas Cromwell anxiously inquired of Henry how he liked the Queen. Henry replied, that he now liked her even less than before. He declared that he had not consummated his marriage because Anna had repulsed him. He claimed to doubt her virginity because of the looseness of her belly and breasts. He also spoke with his doctors, confiding that he believed himself capable of performing sexually, just not with Anna. And the king defended himself from the implication that he might be impotent by claiming that he continued to experience nocturnal emissions. What Henry seems to have been doing is setting the stage for an annulment based on non-consummation of the marriage. And, indeed, within a few weeks, he informed his Privy Council that there must be some impediment to his marriage because God would not allow him to consummate it. He requested that Anna's previous betrothal to the son of the Duke of Lorraine be examined once again to ascertain whether the contract had indeed been a binding one. Henry's counsellors knew exactly what he expected of them. By February of 1540, Anna understood that something was terribly wrong in her marriage. She tried hard to make herself agreeable to the king, and Henry himself continued to dine regularly with Anna and share her bed nightly so she could have no cause for complaint. It is unclear how much she knew about marital relations prior to her wedding night, but one account of a conversation between Anna and her ladies suggests that her ignorance of sex might have been almost total. Her ladies-in-waiting, no doubt fishing for information, indicated to Anna that they hoped she would soon be with child. The Queen replied, I know very well that I am not. How is it possible for you to know that and lie every night with the King? They inquired. Anna again insisted that she was not with child. 
I think your grace is a maid still, said Lady Rochford, George Boleyn's widow. How can I be a maid, asked Anne, and sleep with the king every night? There must be more than this, Lady Rochford replied, treading on dangerous ground. But instead of taking offence at Lady Rochford's impertinent suggestion, Anna patiently explained to her ladies, When the king comes to bed, he kisses me and takes me by the hand, saying, Good night, sweetheart. And in the morning, he kisses me and bids me, Farewell, my darling. Is this not enough? The Countess of Rutland tried her best to make the queen understand. Madam, she began, there must be more than this, or it will be ere long before we have a Duke of York. In other words, a second son for Henry. No, Anna was said to have replied. I am content with this, for I know no more. This is a fascinating and puzzling exchange, the meaning of which is still unclear. Anna seems to imply that she was not aware that there was anything wrong in her marriage bed. But then, she may have been feigning ignorance for the sake of her own reputation or for Henry's. We do not ultimately know whether Henry and Anna did not consummate their marriage. It is possible that Henry spoke the truth and that his disappointment in finally meeting his new queen was so great that he could not frame his mind toward intimacy with her. However, Henry was also 48 years old at the time of his fourth marriage. He was already twice Anna's age, he was running to fat, and the terrible sore on his leg, which would eventually kill him, continued to swell, separate, and stink periodically. Considering the state of Henry's health, in addition to his obvious disappointment with his new wife, it is entirely possible that Henry may have been experiencing impotence and reacting badly to it by blaming his new wife. Whatever the truth of the matter between them, poor Anna was ill-prepared to address it. She had arrived in England, married Henry, and been proclaimed queen all in the space of a few weeks without having yet learned much of any English. This not only made it difficult for her to stay wise to events around her, but also prevented her from being able to express herself to those who might have been able to help. What's more, being so new at Henry's court, she could not have known whom to trust. Sadly for Anna, Henry moved on quickly, and by springtime the king could be seen crossing the Thames regularly in the evenings, headed for Lambeth Palace and his latest mistress, the 16-year-old Catherine Howard, a niece of the Duke of Norfolk. There, grumbling and judgment heard among the people of London regarding Henry's infidelity to his queen was reminiscent of the sympathies which had been similarly expressed for Anne Boleyn when Henry's affair with Jane Seymour became known. On the 24th of June, 1540, Henry sent Anna away from court to Richmond Palace, ostensibly for her health and safety from a plague in London. However, Henry's feelings about illness were such that he surely would have also departed the city if the risks had been real. Less than three weeks later, Henry obtained the annulment to his marriage based on its non-consummation and on Anna's pre-contract to marry the son of the Duke of Lorraine. The Queen was presented with Henry's grounds for a divorce on the 10th of July. Should she consent to it, Henry assured her that she would be treated kindly and provided for. Anna was utterly humiliated and gave way to tears when Henry's request for divorce was read. She initially refused to heed what was asked of her and quickly summoned the Cleves ambassador. Within a day, however, Anna had calmed. She had had time to think, and no doubt both embarrassment and fear had warred with one another in her mind. Should she accept, she would be disgraced and discarded. But should she refuse, she could not say whether the dangerously mercurial Henry would not do her harm. To her credit, Anna was quick and resolute in making her decision, and she followed through to admiration. Anna accepted her divorce from Henry with grace dignity and amiability, 
saying that she hoped that she would still occasionally have the pleasure of his company. Henry was shocked. Anna had been fearful and difficult to deal with during the weeks since he had taken Catherine Howard for his mistress, and he had expected her to resist, to threaten him with the outrage and vengeance of her brother, the Duke of Cleves. Because she readily gave Henry what he wanted, he was generous with her. On the 12th of July, Henry wrote to inform Anna that she was free to return home. However, should she decide to remain in England, she would receive an annual income of £4,000 and the estates of Richmond, Bletchingley and Hever Castle. Despite Henry's earlier claim following his wedding night, he formally affirmed that Anna was still a maid and said she might marry again if she wished. Finally, he hoped she would be pleased to think of herself thenceforth as the king's most beloved sister and assured her that she would always be welcome at court and given precedence over all women in England except for the queen and Henry's own daughters. Apparently, Anne found this generous indeed and readily accepted. In fact, she went even further by assuring Henry that he was welcome to view any correspondence she might thereafter have with her family in Cleves before it was sent. It is possible that Anna might have chosen to stay in England out of fear. One puzzling account claims that the German princess implied that her brother might do her harm if she returned home dishonored. Her arrangements with Henry concluded Anna promptly wrote to her brother to inform him of the accord she and Henry had reached and to assure him that she was happy and content to live out her life in England. The woman, who had spent most of her life in seemingly quiet and biddable obedience, first in the shadow of her mother and then in the shadow of a king, was now a free and independent woman of means. Like the strong female rulers who were her ancestors, Anna had found herself in control of her own life. What's more, she had neither husband nor master to tell her what to do. Anna lived the last 14 years of her life quite happily and comfortably on her English estates and was described by one chronicler as an eminently kind and generous mistress to everyone who served her. She earned Henry's trust and gratitude, not only for her conformity to his will, but also for her continued devotion to his children, for whom she had tried to be a warm and loving stepmother. Indeed, Anna maintained and strengthened her relationships with Henry's children in the years following her divorce. Even Lady Mary came to care for and appreciate her former stepmother in the ensuing years, despite what she perceived as major religious differences between them. Actually, it is still unclear whether the denomination of her religion made any difference to Anna at all. She had embraced Henry's Anglican faith without protest upon arrival in England. During the short and turbulent reigns of Edward VI and Mary I, Anna willingly declared her religious obedience twice. When the nine-year-old Edward took the throne, she affirmed herself a Protestant. When Mary succeeded him as queen, Anna did not hesitate to declare herself a Roman Catholic. Perhaps she was being pragmatic, but perhaps the religious and denominational variability she had been exposed to in Germany and within her own family made her eminently more flexible in a spiritual sense. Anne of Cleves remained highly favoured by Henry's children following his death in 1547. She was often invited to court during the reigns of Edward and Mary, and she walked behind her former stepdaughter Elizabeth in Mary's coronation procession. She got along well enough with Henry's last two wives, although one cryptic comment she made during Henry's wedding to Catherine Parr gave the imperial ambassador Eustace Chapuis the impression that she resented Catherine. Madame Parr is taking a great burden unto herself, Anna was said to have remarked during the ceremony. Chapuis interpreted this statement as catty jealousy from a woman whom Henry had refused to marry a second time after the execution of Catherine Howard. However, it was her brother Wilhelm who had suggested that Henry take his sister back, not Anna. It is possible that Anna meant something entirely different when she spoke of Madame Parr's great burden. Perhaps she was thinking of Henry's most recently discarded wife, the disgraced teenaged Queen Catherine Howard, 
executed for treason at only 19 years old. Anna remained in royal favor until Wyatt's Rebellion of 1554. Because Queen Mary I suspected that Anna might have aided the rebels' cause because of Protestant sympathies and love for her sister Elizabeth, she was no longer invited to court and confined to her estates. By the spring of 1557, Anna's health had begun to decline. She grew thinner and paler and lost her appetite, and historians believe she may have been suffering the final stages of some form of cancer. Anne of Cleves died on the 16th of July, 1557, at the age of 41 or 42. Despite the short duration of her marriage, she had come to be much loved and admired by the English people and by Henry's own family. She was honored with a burial in Westminster Abbey by Queen Mary I, who chose the site for Anna's burial herself and ordered that vigil be kept for her each night until her funeral on the 4th of August. The grave of Anne of Cleves can be found today on the south side of the Abbey's high altar, a plain stone slightly above eye level, which features her coat of arms and reads simply, Anne of Cleves, Queen of England, born 1515, died 1557. Despite the pain and embarrassment that her short, abortive marriage must have caused her, Anna, to use the German version of her name, arguably fared better than any of her five counterparts when her marriage came to an end. Of all of Henry's wives, Anna's origins tend to be the least well known since, from the English perspective, their marriage was little more than a blip in the larger context of Henry's reign, but upon close consideration of what little is known, both Anna herself and her story strike the observer as highly unique and interesting. What do you think of Anne of Cleves? Please let us know in the comments section and, as always, thank you very much for watching.